Alright, welcome back to the evening discussion. Uh, we'll start first with uh, uh, Mike Yesko speaking, and then we will have the candy trivia contest, and then the evening social hour or two. Be great. How much time we have left? <laughs> That's what's taking up the time, so there's no free drinks. So, Randy Kinnig, who's not back from dinner, had to prepare the introduction for Mike Hesco, so I don't have much to say except if you've heard Mike, we had him on the Trash Talk podcast. You know, he has a lot of interesting stories. He worked at Tandy Radio Shack in many different capacities. Uh, so, he knows all of the ins and outs of what happened, the good times, the bad times, successes and failures of Tandy in those magical years um, that we all study and we're in that room. So without further ado, Mike gets go. Right, don't scare me with that, okay? Uh, what I thought I did, since this is a Tandy forum, I'm not going to give a lot of information about my other job, but I wanted to give a little brief biography so you know where I'm coming from. Um, I will say a few things uh, before I start. One is, is that I'm not going to name names, especially in a negative context. All right, I can name a lot of them, trust me. Uh, and one of them actually wouldn't be John Roach. Actually, he and I get along very well. That's because he didn't know me. Um, I will warn you now, I am OCD. I am uh, borderline, uh, they used to call it Asperger's. Uh, I'm one of these people that if I make a left turn, I have to make a right turn, which is very bad when you ski when there's trees on both sides. Oh, no. <laughs> uh, and I'm serious about this. I, I, a friend of mine says, we're driving on the highway, he says, you're counting the telephone poles, aren't you? Yeah. All right, and uh, I am a professional skier now. I don't know, I see how far I fall. All right, I went to high school and started with computers back in the 60s. My high school had a length of my coming college and they had an IBM, I think it was an 1160 or 1180. And we used to program the thing on the cards. Well, actually we had to program on the sheets and we got poor students for a grade to type our sheets in for the cards. <laughs> Run the program, we get them back. Uh, when I went to Lehigh University, I was, I will tell you right now, I'm a nerd beyond belief. I was electrical engineering and engineering physics. <clears throat> Uh, but I didn't finish. Uh, other things became too important and there were some personal issues. During that time, I, like I said, I played with the IBM from my coming college. At Lehigh, we had this Control Data Corporation, CDC 6800. Now, for those of you who know St. Moore Cray, that machine does not exist. What had happened was Lehigh got a CDC 6400, which St. Moore Cray personally upgraded to a CDC 6600 one of three ever upgraded, and then he upgraded that to a 6800 Cybel system, which does not exist. Uh, there was another variant uh, that was the CDC 7000. At the time, it was the most powerful computer in private hands anywhere in the world, and faster than snot. Uh, I don't know how fast snot is anymore. But, uh, <laughs> uh, the other thing is, engineering at Lehigh was very electrical oriented. Uh, even though it was the school where Lee I. Foco went for electrical <coughs> engineering. But we had, like I said, the world's most powerful computer in private hands, all paid for by Bethlehem Steel. And each of the labs, three people were given PDP 8s. So I had to learn the assembly language on a PDP 8, those damn toggle switches. And I actually bought one last week, or last month. Uh, not a true PDP 8, I bought a Pi DP 8, which is actually a Raspberry. Pi, a Pi Zero, which they don't make anymore, inside a case. I'm building it as a kid. Uh, after college, I went through and looking for a job. I serviced gas pumps. This was when gasoline pumps were starting to go digital. Tolkien and Gil Barco, I can tell you all the little bit and workings of these things and how to calibrate them and how to dis miscalibrate them. <laughs> all right, the company that hired me says, oh, we need someone to repair our digital equipment. But guess what? You couldn't service it. You just had to say, oh yeah, it's bad, send it back, and swap it out. So after three months of that, guess what? Goodbye. So uh, I ended up repairing this trucks for him before I left. 
So for a while I was doing sound, sound equipment and electronics work. So I would put antennas in trees 110 feet above the ground. I did one for a lady in Mesquita Valley at the south of Williamsport. And I got three different channel threes by LA and the antenna. So I must have been doing something pretty good. Um, well, the deal was her husband said, we can't see the antenna, you're not allowed to do it to his wife. So she paid me a lot of money. So I climbed the 130 or 140 foot tree and sawed it off. And they had a big spike at the top, like a the back pipe mount, and put the antenna. Hooked everything up, buried the cable to the house, and nothing worked. And so I had to go back to new amplifiers, do everything, climb the tree again, blah, blah, blah. And then I got, she got everything around the dial. And like I said, three different channel threes. I don't know how long it kept working, but it worked then. So I got paid. But in the meantime, I was buying all my stuff from Radio Shack to do all these, these things. I managed to become friends with the manager who then later became a district manager and the friendship went to hell. All right. He was paying me under the table to do his warranty repairs. Now, I don't know how many of you know how warranty work at Radio Shack works. When you buy something at a Radio Shack, that store warranties the equipment, not the company. <laughs> so if something's out of warranty and you take it to a different Radio Shack, you get charged. But if it's in warranty, you take it to another Radio Shack, that Radio Shack gets charged and they have to bill it back to the original Radio Shack. That's why they were so touchy about saying, where's your receipt? So you had to prove what store you bought it from so that they could build that store back for it. <clears throat> what Jeff was doing was he was saying, oh, if it's my repair, you're going to repair it on the back bench. And he couldn't give me cash because of the security with Tandy at Radio Shack. So what he would do was give me credits to take things off the wall. Well, when I started thinking things like big, expensive scammers, he said, no, no, we got to cut back on that. Eventually, he hired me. And I'll get into the things that happened at Tandy. But I spent nine years at Tandy, and then funny, in a fit of anger, moved on. After Tandy, I went to the place called the Center for Clinical Computing in Boston. It was actually a nonprofit foundation out of Harvard Medical School. And I worked for two individuals, Dr. Howard Bleich and Warner Slack, both uh, MDs. And Howard Fleisch was really into patient interviewing. And one of the things I did, excuse me, one of the things I did there was design a box that had a voice synthesizer in it. And we called it the Converse Controller for conversations. And this box would record you. It would analyze your blood pressure, your pulse rate, your breathing, and it even had switches in the chair that was you move the chair because you were upset, you know, and record all this. And Dr. Bleich discovered that uh, people told the computer things that they would never <coughs> tell their doctor. Oh yeah, I have this pimple, and it's not really a pimple, but oh, oh never mind, we won't go there. <laughs> All right, but people would be honest with the computer about certain things that they would never tell a doctor. And his papers are written up in the National Library of Medicine now. After uh, leaving, uh, everything I did there was 63701 based. I went to a small startup and working with people named Guido in the waste disposal business. So you can imagine what that was like. It was weighing garbage. Now you want to get some people to get real rough, find a driver that picks up garbage when it's not on the route, it's paid directly. I did not want to be involved in that. Too many district attorneys. So they stopped paying and I got out of there. I went to work for Raycall Interland. I don't know if you know anything about Raycall. It's a big military uh, but they're very British, very anti-gun, even though they bring their red coats around with guns and fire alarm, the fire salute sets. But they got upset when we brought M16s in at work, so let's shoot at launch time. Um, that, that's actually not a joke, that was true, we did. We <laughs> had an AR-15, and well, no, we won't get into that. Um, at that point, I was running IPX software, network general sniffer software. As a matter of fact, I was in charge of the network general sniffer. Network General got very upset with me because they are the $10,000 base price for the software package. And by the time you buy the add-ons at like a $2,000 or more dollars per uh, protocol, it gets very expensive. And since I was working on the board uh, that supported their stuff, I kept crashing it and had to use a new serial number and then crash and crash. So I figured out how to bust their serial number. Well, they went through the roof. <laughs> so, <laughs> They ended up turning around and saying, look, it, we'll give you 100 serial numbers, and when you run out of them, we'll give you 100 more. Just don't ever let your code that crap that breaks our serial numbers being get out of your office. Okay, fine. Uh, at that time, I was also working with Nobel through Ray Call. And I have the distinction of writing, at the time and for many years afterward, of writing the only 100% certified IPX driver with no caveats. 
and it worked differently than everybody else's drivers. It didn't drop packets. And if you put two boards in at the same time, it got faster. And the st gold standard for how to write an IPX driver with no bell is called the final word by a guy named Jason Lamb. And he called me up and he was very upset and I had to fly out to Provo. Um, they had to write a new appendix for the book <laughs> that handles my driver. So if you know anything about Novell, you are always passing things through packets between foreground and background tasks. Well, my boards were, I was working with network boards that had 186 processors on them. So I said, well, I'm not gonna waste time putting something forward. So I used everything in the background and passed stuff directly through, which they said you couldn't do. Well, the problem was if you take the very last background routing buffer, the whole system crashes and burns. And I figured out how to detect that and prevent it. So he had to write a whole chapter on his book over background routing and, and resources management. So after Ray Paul uh, got laid off there, um, it's, that's another story, I went to work for a startup company called SystemSoft. Now some of you may have heard of that, and Inside was the follow-on to SystemSoft. At one point, SystemSoft, I was told, was 97% of the world laptop market for PCs. We did BIOS, we did drivers, we did all kinds of things. I got hired originally because of a keyboard reset problem. Yeah, it happens every 18 hours or so. Yeah, you try to find that problem. <laughs> I, spend, I spend three weeks going home at night, kicking the door, doing all kinds of things. And finally, I made it worse. I thought, wow, if I can make it worse, I can make it better. So by the end of like three days, I had it down to three minutes. Once I did that, I figured out how to use what's called four pin commands. I get in there, I got it fixed. It was a problem with the hardware accelerator in terms of the chip. When I found a way to get around the problem, everyone wanted to know what I did. IBM was like, tell us, tell us. And Intel was like, tell us. And Bob Angelo, who was the CEO of SystemSoft, said, no, buy us. <laughs> so he said, we want you to put our code default into Intel chips. And Intel said, we're not putting anybody's outside code as the default microcode in our chips. Well, this went on for about three or four days, and finally about four suits showed up at 7.30 in the morning where I worked. And they were there to see Paul Angelo. And so they carted the inside, they said, you're going to tell us what your guy did. Oh, why? We bought 30% of system stuff last night. So needless to say, that's how I got involved with Intel. And from that, I was uh, involved in a number of processors, some that made it to market, some that didn't. Uh, I was involved with a lot of ATA work, which is hard drives. I wrote the very first hard drive hot swappable driver, where you can just yank the hard drive out and put it back in. And Microsoft said it couldn't be done. Well, I cheated. I did. Uh, what I did is, I, as soon as you yanked the drive, I said, oh, it's a floppy with the door open. Put the drive back in. Oh, it's now magically a hard drive. And so, Something Microsoft never, I can't even thought of. The other thing is, is that you know, all heard us think about Microsoft saying they didn't use that much of QDOS for the MS-DOS with how they bought it. Well, I can tell you for a fact that MS-DOS had the IOPO translation table from QDOS in it, <laughs> all right? Because that stopped my driver from working and I had to reprogram around it. And when Microsoft found out, they got very upset. They ended up, okay, well you can do this and you can fix that. And after that, every three months I would get something, a box about the size of two big coolers full of every single software item that Microsoft made. And anytime they did updates, SystemSoft used to get every copy of every version to make sure that we were up to date on these things. I was also involved in Flash. I wrote the very first Flash file system what they call memory technology drivers. Uh, the initial flash didn't have smarts in it. You had to time things or you would be like overboiling a pot on the stove. And flash works by a cup of water. If it's below a certain point on the stove, it's a zero. If it's above a certain point, it's a one. But if you let it go too far, it overflows, puts out the fire, destroys everything. It's like a gas stove that you've now blown out the thing and gas is filling your kitchen that's gonna go boom. But if you let that cup go too dry, guess what? You burn right through the pan. So I wrote some, I wrote a lot of the routines for the first Intel Flash. And as a result, I got really involved with Intel. And we ended up, well, me, uh, and a couple other people were doing peripheral stuff. Uh, wrote all the Flash file system drivers and the MTDs. And as a matter of fact, I have the patent on that. So if you just Google my last name and you will Google with plus system soft, you'll find the patent for how all the Flash man memory management windows work inside the chips. So, and I wrote the very first socket services. 
<coughs> did not like the card services. That was, ugh, that was, I don't want to touch that. Uh, the, um, from Systemsoft, uh, they, they ended up folding up. Of, one, of, one of the things I did in Systemsoft was a lot of you may remember batteries for laptops all of a sudden started appearing with these five blade connectors on the end, the smart batteries. They were developed using a board called the Duracell Smart Battery Development System. That was my hardware design from the <coughs> And it was the most extensive single hardware design I have ever done. It was a full-size IBM PCAT card. You took, put it in your PCAT 16-bit. You had to take the 8048 out of the motherboard, and you ran a 40-pin cable from my board down and plug it into the processor because I emulated it with another processor. In addition to that, Anything for up to two PS2 connectors on the back of your IBM PCAT were fed into my processor, so you could have keyboard and mouse. In addition, across the top of that, since I was doing this for laptop batteries, was a 50 pin connector that tied to a scanned keyboard. And yes, I had all this working, believe it or not. And then in addition to that, since you were testing on my board, I had two more PS2 connectors for two more keyboards. And the end result, you could actually run two mouse and three keyboards at one time on one system. And so a lot of people started using this in the industry for developing for laptops. But the whole point of it was to develop for batteries. So it had the five-blade five connector on the back with charging circuits and ran through what's called SMB. Now, SMB is the system management bus. It's like I2C, you know what that is. That's how a lot of your radios and your cars communicate the different things. It's a two-pin wire. Two, uh, two wires that communicate between all the parts and they have their own protocol. SMD is like a superset of that. Well, a subset of that with special criteria. Plus I had charging circuits and loading circuits. And, uh, I got paid extra for doing that at Systemsoft. They said, oh, can you do this over the Christmas holidays? Okay. Yeah, right. But I did. Um, and also when the first uh, cameras came out for the Palm, little Palm devices, they were cameras that clipped on the bottom. They were developed by a company called AOX. I wrote the video drivers for that in the cameras. And I thought it was unique because the palms were only 9600 baud serial. And I figured out how to focus through a 9600 baud serial board without a fuse screen. And I wrote, I wrote an algorithm that I probably should have patented. I used what's called the JPEG compression ratios and I looked for the J, JPEG granularity index. And I just said, okay, focus until it's the best. And it worked. Then they didn't pay us and they went out of business. They sold the cameras anyway. All right, after that, um, I, I got into racing, drag racing. And that, when I got into racing, that was the, this was about 2003, was the first time I really wrote anything other than in a somewhere. I'm one of these guys that digs fence hole posts with a spoon. Takes a long time, but you have absolute control over the dirt. Um, I wrote a program that used an FAA algorithms that calculate engine run out for airplanes at high altitude. They calculate how drag racing cars perform. And I wrote a software package that would predict what you would do. Now, a lot of people don't understand drag racing is, <clears throat> it's not about going fast. You have two people, one guy can do a 10 second, one guy can do 11 second. So when these guys come up in bracket racing, which is where the average guy makes money, the 11 second guy reads first because he's slower. The idea is you both get to the finish line at the exact same time. And there's a lot of games these people play. Well, I'm gonna run a 10-5, and then in the last second they say, no, I'm gonna run an 11. And the reason they do that is because if you leave first, you have to be perfect. If you mess up, you've messed up first. And the other guy can just sit there and smile and roll through the starting gate. I won. So I wrote software that predicted down to a hundredth of a second as to what your car would perform based on temperature, altitude, humidity, and other factors, weather factors, and even took in the two lanes. And the software had to learn the lanes. And for about two years, I could go to almost any drag strip and not have to pay for my beer. And I sold that software for $600 a copy. I had people calling me, and one day called me at like two o'clock in the morning screaming at me because his son won a national title. So that was exciting. Uh, since then, I've never drag race. I have a high performance vehicle. I've had a couple high performance vehicles. I still have one, uh, which I, if you know who Paul Schreiber was, he's the guy who designed a lot of the graphics for Tandy. I scared the crap out of him on my bike. So, yeah, he still tells stories about how he uh, was scared on that thing. I've been a ski instructor now for over 20 years. 
And uh, I think people say, what's your email address? Oh, it's dad underscore skis. Well, that's a real professional email address. Well, it actually is because I'm a professional ski instructor now. As a matter of fact, I'm going for my next office certification next month. So, that's so much of my history. But since this is the Tandy Forum, you guys want to know all about the Tandy. All right, I told you before that I was going to things in the back of the stores. Well, finally the store manager says, oh, we're hiring you. So I had to go take polling leaves. That was the days when uh, Tandy insisted on these uh, uh, lie detector tests. So I go take the test, and they say, no, you're too technical. All right? So, okay, so, but I was still doing my stuff for Jeff, you know, repairing in the back room, making some money on that. Jeff got a little upset when I, like I said, when I started taking scanners and selling them. So, because that's how I, that's the only way I can get cash, you know. Oh, yeah, I'll take this $140 scanner and sell it to a friend for $100. Uh, the security attendee would have, uh, would have had balloons coming out their butt. Uh, but finally, the attendee turned around and said, okay, we're going to hire you. And I quickly rose to the top as one of the top salesmen. Um, had one really interesting uh, situation occur. Uh, in my early days, I didn't know all the policies, and one customer called up like two days after a big sale, and so he, he was irate on the phone, and I just wanted to not deal with him. So I put the cup of my hand over the microphone and put the mic hand on the counter, and I yelled to the back of the store, hey, Jim, we got an irate customer on the phone. Well, what's the problem? And I told him, he said, well, tell him the community, we'll give him a credit for the difference. So, oh, okay. I picked up the phone, totally forgetting that if you lay a phone on a big glass countertop, all right, it's like a microphone. I didn't, I, you could have amplified it into the phone when I said I have an irate customer. Uh -oh. So I said, hello, before you start, let me tell you one thing. <laughs> I am not irate before, but I am now. <laughs> he came in and tried to punish me, but I turned it into a sale. He got out of there spending $250 more than he was coming in for a $60 credit. So, and it turned out over the next year, he was my best customer. Oh, I, I called him up on the phone. Oh, we got this new cassette deck with three heads. Oh, shit. Oh, excuse me. Uh, he'd come in and I said, no, come on, get to buy this, get to buy this. And he'd buy it. And then he'd curse the whole time. But he kept leaving my best commission. Um, the, after uh, Christmas, I was promoted to a store manager, and they gave me a store in a little town called Mill Hall, PA. You know, I had days where I had three customers. I had days that I had more refunds than customers paid. All right, and but I always managed for the month to beat every store in my district except that one store I started at, which was the top store in the district. I did it by you know, holding off farmer sausages, that kind of thing. Uh, the TRS-80 came out in the summer of 1977. August 3rd, I remember that day, because about two months before, at that time, Tandy was starting to sell individual I.O. chips, and A80 processors on what's called a blue wall. And I was starting to build the computer. I was going to build it at Southwest Technical Club. And then they sent a letter around and said, oh, we're coming out with a computer. So I stopped, and when the August 3rd came around, I was hooked. I was hooked. I immediately got one order with a fake name, went $100, because that's how you had to do it in those days. And it took till November till it came in. Well, we ended up getting in the EI, uh, and things went forward from there. But for, if for those of you that, with a Model 1, you know that without a disk drive, that EI can be deadly, especially with the memory glitches. And I, can, I know what causes, people don't really seem to understand what causes the memory problems in the Model 1, we'll get into that. But, but I was in an area where there was tons of electrical interference problems, and we were running a program called RAIN. That program was written on a PDP-11 at the University of Pennsylvania. They said, you can't run on anything forward on a PDP-11. Well, I ended up converting it onto a TRS-80. Of course, it took 12 minutes to load every time play. the program glitched off cassette. So I said, well, I gotta do something about this. So, and RAIN was a program that calculated the amount of rainwater runoff based on the saturation of the soil and certain stream levels and so on. It was used for the, the, the CEDACOG people, uh, the Council of Governments paying for the development so that we could predict flooding in that area. And uh, when I converted it, um, these resets were killing us. So I figured I gotta do something about that. And I couldn't figure out how to stop the resets because it really wasn't the computer's fault, it was the glitching in the power out here in the country. 
uh, Mill Hall is right next to where Piper Aircraft is. There are more bear in that county than people. Schools have off the first day of deer season because 14 year olds hunt. Kids bring their guns to school to work on them. And that's how far out in the country we are. Um, so I, I figured I had to do something at the New York City, so I figured I'll make it battery power. So I figured, well, how am I going to do this? Well, first off, I had to break the seal, which was a verboten for store managers to do. So I figured, well, I got to figure out a little bit better than just going in and mucking around. So I managed to call Steve Leininger, who would design the thing. He says, oh, well, yeah, but I have to get permission from John Roach. He's the vice president over American Manufacturing. Oh, so I called John Roach. He says, you can't do it or you're fired. I said, well, I'm going to do it anyway, so you might as well fire me right now, but let me have the schematics in the meantime. <laughs> so he talked to Steve Lanyard, and he called me back, and he said, I'll tell you what, I'll give you the schematics if you promise me that no one else sees them, and you take a poly when you send them back after two weeks. I said, fine. He sent me the schematics. I made a battery pack up that was a, uh, a tiered battery pack using different types of batteries at different levels, and the TRSA would run over an hour on batteries, and it would work through any of the glitches. And I wrote up a report, sent the schematic back, sent the letters to Leininger and the Roach. Didn't hear anything. And then Roach called, and I called Roach one day and I said, Look, do you want me to get the polygram? And he says, Did you show it to anybody? And I said, No. Did you copy it? No. He goes, No, we're okay. So that sort of got me noticed by engineering. Uh, but I was done with, with retail. I had a regional manager that came in, just goes up to my desk and swept everything on the floor, put his feet on my desk and said, Let's go, you're finished in retail. He says, I won't fire you, but you're done here. So I said, okay. So I turned in my store, went back to retail sales, and eventually quit. After I quit, I got a call from the former district manager that now became the regional manager for repair. He says, I need help. And I go, where? He goes, up in, up in New York and Long Island. I said, oh my God, Long Island. And he goes, no, look, can you go up there? Help me out. Repair computers. We're stuck. So next thing I know, I'm driving out on Long Island, I'm working repairing computers. And the repairing the TRS 80s in those days was pretty much a board swap, except until they ran out of swappable boards. So you had to learn how to fix them. Uh, the other thing that was uh, the Schubert uh, floppy drives. We started getting a lot of <coughs> bearing noises. And the bearings were something that you had to send them back to Schubert. And they were in short supply. So I went to Sears, got a hammer and some tools, and I managed to figure out how to get the bearings out and get new ones in without damaging the chassis. Which again, next thing I know, I'm on an airplane down to Fort Worth, off the tech support, we everything worked out. The, the guy that helped me with the bearing was Jimmy Johnson. And I'm back at Fort Worth, they wanted to tuck her back in Long Island, and they were talking to my regional manager about moving me to Fort Worth, and, and I said, no, I'm not going to Fort Worth. That's Texas. Uh, I'm not going down there. So, uh, that's so another interesting thing there. I had, a, I had the mobster. Now, I had heard that this was going on, so I wasn't the only technician that ran into this. I had to repair the drives on site and see this huge light knife switch on the side of the desk. I go, what the heck is that for? And the guy looked at me and he goes, watch. And he <laughs> the light switch. And in the one position, the knife switch killed all the power to TRS-80. And in the other position, the trash can started humming. And he, then he opened the drive, diskette drive doors, and he pulled the diskettes out. He says, I dropped them into the trash can. And it was electromagnets at the bottom of the trash can. So, and this, this guy was a pretty tough guy. You didn't want to mess with this guy. Next thing I know, he's writing letters to John Roach about me about bunny rabbits and how good I am. So I got called him about this bunny rabbit, which is. <laughs> so, anyway, uh, I, I've been told that that trick was used by a, a number of the. Less than um, upper level people, shall we say. <laughs> the numbers racket used to do a lot of things and they wanted quick destruction of your data. Okay, anyway, I got pulled out of there and sent down to the regional repair center in Bath, PA. And from there, um, I got to do over from Newport News up through uh, New Jersey. Not in the New York, though, although I did have to cover New York. Um, which was another story I'll tell you in a second. Uh, the, uh, the big things I had to deal with were like the cassette problems. You all know about the XRX3 by now, right? The little extra circuit board that's on the yeah. final one. What was happening is when they wrote the first version of the basic with level two, uh, at, when you read a bit 
you have the clock bit and the data bit. When you read a bit, the software would immediately start looking for the next bit. Well, why in the world are you looking for something when it's supposed to be the dead time? You get any noise on the cassette tape, guess what? It reads wrong data, that's why you don't read the data. You get a corrupted cassette. So the XRX3 board was a board that actually time sliced out the cassette input port. If you look at an XRX3 board, you see it's mostly a counter circuit. And basically all it does is turn off the cassette port for a short period of time after it reads about the data. Now the problem with that is you speed up the Model 1 CP, excuse me, CPU board with one of the speed up kits, you can't because it's hard coded for the XRX3. They did fix the uh, cassette problem in the later level two basics, the ones that say L2 instead of level two. Uh, those you don't want to use the XRX3, you're better off with the firmware. <coughs> they will coexist, but they cannot speed them up because of the XRX3. The other problem with cassettes was the cassette decks at the time. If you stop them in the middle of data, they glitched the tape. And it was a problem with the actual cassette deck. <coughs> well, no big deal if you only had single-sided cassettes. But if you had a double-sided cassette, guess what? You now put a glitch in the tape, right through the tape, from the pulse going back through the chassis. So that, that was a simple fix to fix as well. During that time, uh, like I said, I was brought to the attention of, of tech support or of Fort Worth. So the next thing I know, I'm flying down to Fort Worth and they show me all the new stuff. I got to see the Model 2, I got to see a Project Green <coughs> Thumb, which, which didn't really make it well. It was a private little project that eventually became part of what's called the communications multiplexer. But it was a TRS-80 Model 1 case with a 6809 with the color display. And it was more of a terminal than anything else. And it was run for the University of Kentucky for agricultural use. And had a mode in it and everything else. Uh, uh, during that time, uh, like I said, I got to see the Model 2. Uh, this was about six or eight months before it was announced. It was still pretty much breadboard, although they did have some plastics design. And I got to meet the designers, which Sam Sawyer and Mike Berger. And I became real good friends with Sam Sawyer. Matter of fact, Sam was the one that got me hired eventually at Raycall because he was there. And Sam and I used to go hunting all the time. And he's crazy in the woods with a gun, trust me. Um, and Mike Berger's crazy on a motorcycle. Just don't ever get me. That's another story. Maybe I'll tell that later, too. Um, anyway, because I was involved in the Model 2, I got one uh, about two months early. And it was a really neat idea because when they sent it to me, they said, you can't let anyone see it. So where I was at, all of a sudden, I got an office built for me with a locking door. So no one else could get in there. And there was this one 18-year-old girl. No, I won't go into that. <laughs> <laughs> I was the only guy that had the moves on her. All right. Everyone else was all over her. And I was like, no, no, Carol, no, no. So guess where she comes every day? And my Okay. Anyway, so I had the Model 2 in the office. It was finally announced that they were coming out with it. You get the store managers coming into the regional. Office. Oh, man, you hear about this new Model 2? Oh, yeah, you want to see one? <laughs> that was kind of an ego trip. Uh, it ran Tristos 1.0, and being 1.0, you can imagine how bad it was. All right. Uh, but it did work, and it was a nice machine. I didn't have any extra drive base, so. During that time, uh, the computer, um, one of the computer stores sold a computer to a guy named Howie Wallowitz. Now, yes, that name may sound familiar if you watch The Big Bang Theory, which I'll tell you about in a minute. He burned it up. He called the computer center. They said, well, we don't fix it here. You have to go out to Long Island and fix it. And so he called out to Long Island, and I don't know who he got because the manager wasn't there at the time, but they basically got a, you didn't buy it here, we can't fix it here. What we meant was, we can't fix it right now. You have to wait to schedule it. So he gets on the phone to Fort Worth. Next thing you know, Sam Sawyer's wife, who worked in customer service, called me because, look, can you go to New York and help us out? And he, she called the regional manager. And I was basically told, can you go to Long Island, to Beth Page, and you were to walk in and tell them you're there to meet this customer. And if the manager says one word, you're to ask for the keys and lock the door. So I went in there, met Howie Wallowitz, fixed his computer. He was happy. He went home. The next day, I get a phone call. My computer burned up again. So this time on my nickel, I drive to New York City, downtown, and I go in and I fix this computer. And it turned out, uh, for those of you who don't know the Model 2, early Model 2s had an issue that the Motorola monitor wasn't synced. It depended everything on the video card. And if you put the wrong frequencies out, 
you would burn up the monitor. When the monitor burned up, it would short out this $13 transistor and feed the power back into the FD, the video card, and burn that up as well. All right, and so we went through about four repairs on this machine and we couldn't get it fixed. So finally I said, look, I'll give you mine and I'll take yours. So I gave him my prototype computer after making sure it was up to standards and took his. Worked fine for me. And my computer in his office worked fine. Now Howie was the kind of guy that would, he would program for 30 hours at a time, then sleep for 24 hours. We won't tell you what other things he was doing during that 30 hours, but let's just say he stayed focused. Um, and he developed what eventually became Profile 2, which was at the time the largest and most well-distributed database manager in the world because it was sold under Profile, it was sold under FileFo, FilePro, it was sold under the name of Lex Falker, it was available on mainframes, on Apple, everything. And his small computer company became worth millions. His first employee was Bill Prady, who was also an ex-IBM programmer with worked on ZAE systems. Well, Bill Prady was a nice guy, stayed with Howie for a while, they were very good friends, said, I'm tired of this, he quit, went to work for Jim Henson at the Muppets, stayed there for a while, said, I'm going out to California, got out there, said, oh, I have an idea for a TV show, Dharma and Greg, with Chuck Lower. Then after that, he goes, oh, I got another idea for a TV show, it's gonna be about nerds. <laughs> so he called up Howie and said, Howie, I'm gonna use your name in this TV show, and that's where the Howie Wallows came from. And the real Holly Wallowitz has been on the on the Big Bang Theory as one of the background characters, not a speaking role. But uh, anyway, I did find the problem with that. It was the connector on the motherboard. We were joking that it was the case because we couldn't find anything wrong. I ended up taking it home and putting it in my shower just to steam it all up. And I found a, a problem on the motherboard connector that had been D4 which caused the video board when it was initialized. Remember I said the, the video had to be synchronized? Well, with data bit D4 bad, programmed the sync wrong, burned up the monitor, then burned up the card. So that was one of my, wow, I found that. Of course, that only took me about three months. All right, after uh, I was doing all that with the tech support, uh, when the Model 2 was finally delivered, they said, we want you to go to Florida and set them up before they were actually released. So I flew down, I flew to Texas, got everything arranged, flew back to Pennsylvania, and then said, okay, I'm ready. I flew down to, uh, to Miami, and there were supposed to be 10 machines. Uh, they were delivered directly to the local radio shacks, not to the computer centers. So <clears throat> they all came through smashed. Ooh. The first Model 2s had no reinforcements on the top of the disk drive or on the top of the power supply and monitor. And with the bottom of the case like this, it was a big U, which was a tuning fork, and, and, and smacked everything. So I was in a panic to get these things done. So uh, over four days, I was scooting around in Florida. Uh, I drive down to Key West for the very last one, which is supposed to be a 32K model for the Key West police to get there, and it's not there. I'm trying to call for it. Where, where's the machine? Where's the machine? In the meantime, Hurricane Frederick is bearing down on the Key West. So I had nothing to do on Sunday, so they couldn't find out what had happened to the machine. So I went out and scheduled a scuba or a snorkel scuba trip. So I missed that, so I said, okay, we'll do it Sunday. So on Sunday I go out, they take us to Sand Key, which is the farthest key, about 100, maybe 50 miles out past Key West. And it's just like the, the Gilligan, you know, so the weather started getting rough, the tiny ship was tossed, people were puking all over the boat on the water, and they ended up giving us our money back. Uh, so then Monday morning, it's a really bad storm, and I find out that the 32K machine was never shipped, because it was 32K, so okay, I'm heading to Miami. So I'm driving out in this really wicked storm, I'm coming up through the Keys, I finally get to Miami about 4 o'clock, I, I said, oh, I'm going to take a dip in the pool uh, before I go to dinner. I turn on the TV and said, Hurricane Frederick slammed in the Key West and showed these palm trees bending over and sweeping the ground. You know, and I was in there. Okay. So anyway, they, that was one of the lessons they learned about shipping, which uh, is a little story later. All right. Uh, anyway, I evidently did a good job. So they, uh, well, one of the things is that they, they promoted me then to Fort Worth. They basically told me you either take a, a demotion, but at a lot bigger pay, and go manage a store in Harrisburg and manage a repair center, or come to Fort Worth. And so I said, all right, I'll go to Fort Worth. So I get down there, and it was not what I expected at all. Uh, they hired me, I was teaching in tech support. 
I was teaching logic, number systems, and then the repair of individual machines. And we actually had the University of Texas of Arlington uh, computer faculty come in and take the course. And they liked it so much, we got three, three credit hours accreditation for the course. So even though I'm not degreed, I've actually taught a three credit course at ETA. Um, one of the individuals who was also an instructor there was named John Prickett, and the uh, funny story about him is that we used to always get fat, the telexes. They always use the first five letters of your last name. So you can imagine what happened when his telexes came in. They had to change the rule and say John P. <laughs> All right. Uh, Mr. Prickett was in the, he was fascinated by 6800 systems. He had smoke signal broadcasting, he had all the old 6800 and 6809 stuff. And he wanted to build a TRS-80 that was clocked by a crank. <coughs> he changed everything to static parts and you could actually crank the knob and watch the address and data bus change from the LEDs lined up. It was really neat. Didn't quite work the way it was supposed to, but it was still kind of neat. All right, um, and during that time, um, Someone wrote a game. Now, I know well, this is kind of a weird thing to break into the middle of this thing. It was called Tower 2. And adventure games were real popular back then. Someone wrote a game called Tower 2 and it ran on a TRS-80 Model 2. And the, uh, the basic scenario of the game was you go to the tower, you park in the lot, you take the subway into Tandy Tower, you go ice skating, you go back to your car and someone stole your distributor rotor coil, rotor, and left a note that says, ha ha, find it. And you have to follow clues, just like a regular adventure game. Only the clues were a trek through the towers of all the unreleased hardware. <laughs> so it had the satellite systems, it had the color computer, it had the Model 100, it had some of the new audio stuff, it had everything from every department. You couldn't say it was R&D, you couldn't say it was system design, you couldn't say it was the audio group. It went ballistic with security, trying to find out who wrote that game. And eventually there, I realized there were five different versions of the game, so I think people were adding to it <laughs> every time they got it, just to piss off security. So it was a neat game. Uh, during that time, there was uh, one of the things that people have heard about was the fake ads, and I brought one. This ad actually ran in a, news, in a magazine. Managers, now blame your incompetence on a TRS-80. <laughs> And that's the sole recipe of the advertising department. This guy's in merchandising, I forget his name. Uh, Playboy is, of course, in the game on the display. And it says, it comes with CYA80 software, the choice of professional professionals. <laughs> <laughs> and the ticket, at, and you have to read it, and I'll leave it up here for you to read. I, I used to have an 11 by 17 glossy of this. <clears throat> it says, okay, John Roach, I'm tired of getting blamed for my mistakes. Send me a TRS-80 catalog right today. <laughs> and we actually got these coupons back. A lot of them. What it was is a magazine called the Yellow Jaundice. And the Yellow Jaundice was like the trade journal of the newspapers in the Dallas Fort Worth area that had Sunday supplemental magazines. And every April they would run a parody of their ads from their magazines. And the one year they ran a parody of the Radio Shack Pocket Computer What? They said the Pee Wee computer that goes everywhere, even where you pee. They had a hand drawing of three guys at urinals, and one of them was holding up a pocket computer. One worked on it while you were standing there. Well, Tandy did not like the ad. It was not that they didn't like the ad, they didn't like the fact that it was done very amateurishly. And the magazine apologized, and they said, they said, well, we're sorry, we won't do anything again. Because it was a really immature and very poor quality attempt. So the following year, they called Tandy up to apologize again for the previous year and said, Tandy goes, oh, that's okay, we'll give you an ad. And this is the ad that they gave them. And they ran it as a full page ad. And like I said, they got the coupons back. And you have to read the ad. And the software is uh, hookers from space, uh, Debbie has Tristos. Oh, your, your, computer, your computer comes with the Tristos disk oblivion system. So it's an um, interesting ad. Um, another thing that was kind of a little funny thing that happened was that there was a, about that time, there was a book by a guy named Tom Ryan, and he was a systems level programmer at IBM in New York. And he wrote this book called The Adolescence of P1. 
And today, if you ever think about viruses and malware and everything, this is what started it all. Not that this book started it, but it was basically about a drunk college kid who wanted to get more time on the computer, so he wrote a little routine to hack in and set up what's called the privilege level one on the IBM system. And he wrote an algorithm that actually works to hack the IBM system, set the privilege level bet. Well, the book went through tech support and some of the technical groups at Tandy like wildfire. It was actually given to me by Howie Wallowitz to say, you gotta read this book. So I did. Well, the first thing I did was I wrote a program called P1. And it re sat resident on a TRS-80 Model 3, and it was hidden. Now, it wouldn't replicate itself like a virus today does, so I don't consider it malware. But what it did was it included the system that went resident and stayed hidden. And in the storyline, uh, the computer virus becomes sentient and starts killing people to protect itself and to protect its author. And it finds out who its author is and goes into their business and says, shuts down all the computers and says, call Gregory. Well, when Gregory says, Gregory here, the computer comes back and says, long time no here. And then he says, that, and there's commands you can give it like to ask for your status for the number of systems and so on. And it actually, actually has control over the hardware as well. You can't reset it out of the system. So the program I wrote was a resident in a TRS-80 and it loaded right with the operating system. And I put it on Tom King's machine and after about a minute of him sitting at his desk off his computer goes, call Gregory. <laughs> so he was like, what? It's a break key. Computer says, don't hit break again, call Gregory. <laughs> so then he tried to reset. Well, because I had it hooked into the operating system, as soon as it loaded more than like five seconds, it comes up and says, don't reset me or I'll reset you, call Gregory. <laughs> and the only way out of it was to type in the command to ask for the status from the book. So that program ended up going through a lot of departments like wildfire. So, and I figured it was pretty benign. And it was a lot of fun. And <clears throat> weird things. Uh, there was also a situation, some of you may have heard of it, called the, the Rummy Buzzard. <clears throat> All right, at one point um, there was a bug in Tristos that it would always assign an extra sector. Now it didn't affect operation, but it would always let an extra sector be allocated without actually writing it. So if you wrote 10 sectors to the disk, the file allocation would say, oh, you have 11 sectors. It would never write the 11th sector. So whatever was in that as core trash was now in the file. It didn't matter for programs because your program was self-executed. But back in those days, if you ever listed the Hertz 50 file, you would find the phrase, hello, you Ruby buzzard. All I can say is, thank God that's the phrase that showed up. Because what had happened was there was a disk that was full of obscenities. Absolutely full. I learned things. <laughs> this is something that <laughs> The problem is, is they fixed the bug for the extra sector allocation, sent the operating system over to take the software to duplicate and they duplicated the disk with all the core trash. Oh. Well, Wayne Green had went on a field day about it in the 80 microcomputer. Story doesn't end there, <laughs> all right? I'm sitting at my desk and this guy named Cam comes into my office and goes, what about the Rummy Buzzer? I go, what? He goes, the Rummy Buzzer. And I go, well, that's old news. He goes, well, we got this guy that sent this letter. And I read the letter and it says, and it's a polite letter, but it's a little bit of a nasty tone to it. And the ends with, you can call me a son of a bitch in my face, but I'd really like to know why my computer is cursing at me. Now, for those of you who don't know, different countries has different phrases and languages that's obscene or objectionable. If you're British, Rummy Buzzard is not a very good thing to say. All right? So I call the guy. He's in San Francisco. He answers the phone with a British accent. So I ran off the bat. He sent a screen print, and a Model 3 could screen print. And he sent a print screen print because his computer went into double sized characters and said, hello, you want me buzzer. <laughs> right. so that's, that's where this whole thing could start. So I talked to the guy, and it turns out he had a, <laughs> a memory fault. So I get them all fixed up. And again, I get more letters to Roach about things that I fixed that probably should have stayed below the radar. But it turned out that uh, that was done. Uh, that, that was interesting, to say the least. Um, during that time, I ended up being with Tandy for five years, and this is another one of my contentions, is that I took vacation over my five-year pin at the company meeting for all the support operations. And I was not 
shall we say, appreciated by my boss. Well, I was, I was appreciated. I would always be given the tough projects because I could always deliver. But there was always uh, a nastiness between us. Uh, and it goes back to a personal issue. So I'm on my vacation and I get a phone call. You gotta come back and you gotta give this presentation at the meeting. I go, well, what do you mean I'm giving a presentation? Well, you gotta do this presentation on the one printer. <coughs> All right, so I fly back from Pennsylvania, I get there, and guess what? I don't do the presentation. It was all because Roach wanted to give me my five-year pin, and he didn't have the guts to tell Roach I'm not there. But I made out. The candy gave me first-class tickets around, and another week of vacation later, so I, it ended up being okay. <laughs> so it's, I actually won on that one. Uh, during that time, another thing was the dancing demon. You had me probably talk about that. Um, Tandy had all kinds of memory problems uh, with the Model 1 and then later with the Model 3 that you could not find. All these memory tests were written. And like people talk about writing a memory test with basic. I'm here to tell you it cannot be done. All you can really do with basic is say, is it there or not? To do a memory test, there's a lot of things you have to do. You have to not only test individual memory cells, but you have to test that there's no interaction. Not only with the chips themselves, within the chips, with address and lines, but also with power and also with the JSON address buses. It's been data bus. It's a very complex thing. And that's why the memory test takes so long to run, even in machine code. One thing that the most memory tests cannot do is test the fact that the Z80 is unique. The Z80 does not need refreshing of the RAM because it does the refreshing. It generates an extra M state because it uses the register, the R register, which is part of the IR, the interrupt register, it's called IR. It's where they get it, uh, and the R register is basically a register that runs and just does what's called the row address select refresh of RAM, of that memory RAM. And that's how they generate random, pseudo random numbers, is they seed it with that value. That's why in CAD processor you get pseudo random numbers where everybody else has a lot of problems. Well, they do this refresh during the opcode fetch cycle. And you can't not test that with a software program by reading and writing and doing things. The only thing you can test it is during the opcode fetch, which means you have to write a program that runs during the memory cycle. The dancing demon does that. So people were saying, my dancing demon fails, but their memory test shows fine. And Tom King ended up writing a program that tested all the possibilities of how you run through that and reduced it. Uh, the Z80 does three, three, mem, three M states, uh, which is the opcode fetch data to data, and then there's T states within the M states, and where the CPU puts an extra T state in and stretches it for the refresh, that means that the next fetch of the opcode is reduced timing. So he wrote a program that tests it, that shifts by one byte, tests it again, that shifts by one byte, and tests it again. And you can't test every single memory location in the machine, except if you test the machine and it passes, then you pull the middle 16K out, put a new middle 16K in, and then test it, because it'll start below it and work through it and then test it after it. It's the only way to test memory 100%. And then you have to take the memory that you tested and move it to the top and bottom so you're sure that you have that. Okay, so any of these people that you see all the time saying, oh, I wrote a basic test to test my memory. Well, you wrote a basic test that wastes time. That's about how <laughs> All right. During that time, I was, I was, like I said, I was having some problems with the individual. So I said, okay, what do I want to do? Well, my roommate at the time was Steve Apple. Steve Apple wrote Tristos too. <clears throat> he was, we and I were in a house together with his wife and daughter. And nothing against Steve, but he was so protective. And his wife was so protective. We're under his porch one day working on it, and we hear this blood curdling scream. We go run into the house, all covered with grease and oil, and there's his wife on the lazy boy with her feet up, like, ah! and his little five year old daughter sitting on the couch. He goes, We saw a mouse. <laughs> so it's like, Okay, fine. But at five years old, she was programming my model, too. Steve goes, Why don't you come up to Candy System Design? So I said, Well, what do I do? And he goes, Write something that we need. So I went up and I talked to Eric Schmidt and a few other guys said, what do you need? Oh, we need a backup program. So I wrote a backup program for Christos 2. Having the guy that wrote it as my roommate means that I had a little bit extra information. I could duplicate a disk jet in 56 seconds reliably from totally blank formatting and everything. I could duplicate a double-sided disk jet in under a minute 40 seconds. 
I interviewed, I showed them the program, they loved it, the director loved it. Uh, they wanted to hire me, but then all of a sudden they hired this college kid. That was the one thing they would have to pay me, by the way, of course. And then he was told to write the backup program. Well, he wrote a program that ran for seven and a half minutes and usually worked. All right. He sent it out to tiny the software assembly. That didn't go over very well at all. It finally got to a frustration level that all of a sudden Tandy Software Assembly got a program that worked. Turned out the copy that I had left with my interview was sent over. So anyway, Steve was timber tampering with Tristos too and made a minor change. Well, since we were roommates and he was using my Model 2 to do homework on it, I knew exactly what the problem was. So I modified my backup utility. Because at home, we were making backups of what you know, staged backups. Well, I finally get this pro, uh, phone call at work. I'm in the international franchise at the time, doing uh, computer support for the Middle East and the Caribbean and Southeast Asia. <coughs> I get this call and says, looking for Mike Jesko. Oh, well, that's me. And you answered the phone as international franchise. And, yeah. He goes, was there another Mike Jesko in the company? Not that I know of. And it was uh, Mark Brown out of Tandy Software Assembly. And he goes, well, we've got this program that's failing. What? And he goes, yeah, our backup program. What? You know, and so he explains to me that they kept the backup program suddenly slowed down over five minutes to make a copy of a single-sided disk head. And very unacceptable. They said it works perfectly except for that. And uh, I'm there, okay, how did you find me? Well, we disassembled the program and found your name in a, co in a comment. <laughs> so I explained to him what happened. He goes, you're kidding. And I said, no. I said, I'm pretty upset. And he goes, well, look, before you go on the war path, let me make a phone call or two. So about an hour later, I get a phone call from Gary Pack, who's the corporate attorney. Now, at that same time, someone had shipped a Model 2 hard disk system to Kabul, Afghanistan, which was under Soviet occupation at the time. It was the UN peacekeeping force. Well, uh, Kabul, Afghanistan is 220 volts and 50 hertz, and the motors inside the hard drive are synchronous AC motors. Not going to work. You have to change the pulley belts. So I'm trying to get information in and out of a war zone with the Soviets. And you can imagine what that's like. I can't get the U.S. to get on the phone line except during certain times to get the sensors on, and the Soviet sensors didn't want me to get through. It just went back and forth, back and forth. So I thought I was called, being called in to get chewed out over something I had done because I had made a few comments to people I shouldn't have when I was frustrated on the phone with the Soviets and the Americans in the department. So I go in, and, and there's this guy sitting there, and he goes, look at um, He said, Mark told me what happened, and I go, oh. He goes, would you be willing to fix the program? Well, yeah. And he goes, we'll pay you. Uh, about the fourth of a price of a new punk act. If I could fix it within two weeks. And I said, no, I already have it fixed. If I had it with me, I'd give it to you right now. And I think you'll watch this guy melt. Because <laughs> the whole factory was backed up. So the next morning, I brought a new copy, and he came right to me. Anything you want. Well, I need a new hard drive. It showed up. 25 bucks. Wow. Right. Um, I need some more diskettes. Two crates of this guy's show. <laughs> All right. After that, I was on what's called the Tandy distribution list. So when Tandy buys software, there's any implication. They are they are allowed to make a certain number of copies for internal distribution that don't count towards royalties. I now was on that list, and I got every single copy of Model Two software. Oh, here's your copy. Here's your copy. Not that I ever wanted it, but it was neat to have. Um, oh, okay. I'll, I'll finish up real quick. Well, anyway, uh, I made friends. Uh, he started giving me merchandise instead of money, so it's, uh, everything worked out. Um, at that point, then, I moved back to tech support, and I managed the diagnostics group. And one of the things that a lot of people don't realize is that the Model 100 diagnostics were all written in assembly on a Model 2. Using ALDS, we created um, uh, aliases for all the instructions and linked over with the Model 2. That's how we could do it quickly for the uh, Model 100. 
And finally, yeah, I was hired to go up into R and D. And actually, there's not as many hardware stories for R and D because that's where Paul Schreiber's going to put in his book of mostly true tales. And he has called me up repeatedly during this morning's talk. Uh, my phone rang in the back. That was Paul cursing at me. You better not blow, blow things for me. So, one final thing is I got a phone call from Mark Brown. And he says, I want you to go over to Tandy System Design to your friend's desk before lunch today. And don't go to lunch. Sit there. I go, what do you mean? No, 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 no. Don't say anything. Just go over and talk to your friend and say you're going to lunch after 12 o'clock, but be there about 10 o'clock. Okay. So I go over and I'm sitting there in, Steve's de in front of Steve's desk and we're talking. And in walks security. And they go into that director's office that stole my software. They said, close your briefcase and escorted him out with their hands on his arms. So there was justice. So uh, the only other thing I was going to say about the Model 2s being smashed up, they were shipping model, for the Model 16s, they decided to do a test ship. So they sent, six, they sent 10 Model 16s to the Philadelphia warehouse with the instructions that they were to be turned around and sent right back to Fort Worth Tandy Business Products. Well, Tandy Business Products started opening them up and got back nine Model 16s, one Model 2. Now they were sent in Model 2 boxes. The fact that the warehouse just said, oh, it's a Model 2, it doesn't matter. A lost Model 16. And Tandy was, we were under orders not to have a Model 16 anywhere viewable by any company employee that didn't know about it. They were really strict. Cam, the guy comes to my office and says, what's a Model 16? I go, what? I had one there, but I had a Model 3 case on it. What's a Model 16? Uh, what are you talking about? Well, this customer claims he got one. Okay. And I said, tell him to describe it. So Cam comes back later. He describes it. Yeah, he got one. So I go over to the director of customer service, a guy named Bill Washington, and said, look, we got a customer with the Model 16. No, it can't happen. So we called the customer. He described it. It was a Model 16. Turns out the boxes got swapped. He had bought four Model 2s, took three of them to his business, and took one home, and it was a Model 16. Well, for those of you not know, the Model 16 times out the drives because of the tandem double-sided drives. Christoph's 2.0A will fail when it times out. They have 2.0B, which handles that and steps faster. Well, I had previously hacked the version of Tristos 2.0D as dual because it worked on all the drives. So the, the, the customer was pretty cool. He goes, I don't know what it is. I'll pay the difference. You're not getting it back. <laughs> <laughs> so I told the customer, I said, look, if you're willing to sign a non-disclosure, you can have it. You don't have to pay a cent but you cannot tell anybody. If I get a contract to you for non-disclosure, will you sign it in front of a lawyer? He goes, yes. And I ended up not ever sending it to him. And I became one of my beta sites. And it was funny because when the Model 16 was finally announced, the computer store said, because he had bought four computers, like, hey, there's a new Model 16. Yeah, I got one at home, you know. <laughs> so anyway, I uh, had some other stories, but I probably won't do that. Um, I would say, if anyone has any questions right now, uh, I'll open it up. I will say, what a friend of one of the tech support guys says, you can't do that, you idiot. Well, he said something else, but it was worse. But go ahead. <laughs> so what were the uh, Model 100 diagnostics that you just was alluding to? Oh, that, uh, um, that, well, we have a full suite of Model 100 diagnostics that were available from national, national parks. Uh, <clears throat> mostly memory diagnostics, modem diagnostics, screen display diagnostics. Uh, memory test, um, printer test, uh, barcode reader. It was, uh, I managed the group then, and it was it was just tedious to try to do anything on the Model 100. So we took the assembly language development system, which was for the C80 on the Model 2, and we basically did all kinds of aliases and it was like a cross compiler or something. Uh, it wasn't really a cross compiler, but the C80 <laughs> and the 8088, 8080. 80 in the Model 100 are so close. Yeah. You know, there's a difference in the multiple red, the dual register sets. Uh, indexing is slightly different, but we can handle that all through macros. Mm. Yeah. We built macro libraries and aliases to do everything. So we can make changes basically on a full screen editor. Of course, you probably can't find that anymore. 
Well, the ALDS was a retail product from Pandia. Right, but I mean, the diagnostic suite. Uh, yeah, that's a shame because they were available to national parks. There were, Radio Shack National Parks had uh, diagnostic suites <coughs> for everything. Yeah. Uh, they weren't cheap though. We sent them to all the shops for free. Uh, we charged hundred dollars for the Model 2 diskette, for example, and I got reamed by the VP of uh, support over, what's this shop doing ordering seven diagnostics discounts? He shouldn't have ordered any, they're free to the shop. Well, it turned out this guy was crashing them again and again and again. So I had to go back and put intentional backup protection in the diagnostics, only it was reverse protection. It wouldn't let you run the disc until you ran the backup. And then after the backup, it removed itself. And I know people who tried to bust that to figure out what it was. It was so simple. I mean, it was. It was uh, I've, I've seen other backup protection on discs that are even more <laughs> simple than mine. But uh, all I did was hide my name in one of the index centers. And if it didn't find it, it, it went into the menu that said, "Whoa, you can't run until you back up." But because <coughs> it generated a backup under Christos 2.0, it regenerated all the index centers. So it wouldn't regenerate. It would regenerate with clean indexes. It wouldn't find my name. So, yes? Did you write the backup program? It was a disk duplicator that we used a Tandy computer symbol, uh, which was different than the Tristoff one. Um, the, the software that I wrote was for the Model 2. Okay. No, I mean, it was a Model 2 disk duplicator. It and was, it was set up so that you put you put the disk head in, you boot the machine, right. and then you took it out, you put your master in drive zero, and then your three extra drives would just do to do to do, yep. and it checked for the drawer being open so you could walk away and it wouldn't overwrite. Yep. And yeah, that's a mind. Okay. Yeah, I got. It was noisy as hell, but yeah. Like I said, it would duplicate a diskette even with the CDC drives and the Steve Shugarts, and it was 56 seconds. You're right. And it duplicated everything, including backup protected disk. So I was pretty proud of that. I wrote that in about two weeks. All on assembly. What I didn't like about it, it was just very noisy because it would, it would copy only one track. So well, it had to do that because of the amount of buffering that you have. Yeah. Um, and because when you when you do that, I write the program uh, formatted the track, and I had to create a format image to lay down the sectors. Right. And they're just, I, I might have been able to do two tracks at a time, but then I would have had to go back to one track for, for double sided. And no, now you're changing format and modes and everything. No, let it bang around. <coughs> and I was told by Mark Brown that in some cases the machines were left up for a week and then we needed to reset. The program never glitched. It just, you know, they told me it was the most reliable program they've ever run for backup. Yeah, the only thing I had to do is I had to. Uh, Realign the drives or check the alignment every, I think it was every week or. Uh, yeah, it's, um, when you're duplicating off of, of the user equipment, essentially, which is what it was, you're at the mercy of, of the, like the alignment and such, and dirty heads. Because right. uh, you have to generate a, a clean image. And that was one of the things nice about doing it that way, though, is it did generate a clean image. Well, as clean as the original image was, because it, it also copied the core trash sector. So you don't want to get into a Romy Buzzard situation again. Yeah. And again, like I said, we're just real so lucky that it was only the Romy Buzzard phrase that was come there. Because <laughs> there was a lot of stuff on that disc. Any other questions? Well, also, one real little uh, quick thing in there. Um, Tandy was always, always about image to, you know, about beers and, and, uh, and in tech support and engineering, we can pretty much get away with things. But one of the things that Tandy did is they hired this VP from IBM and it started making rules about white shirts and ties if you go to visit someone, well, the engineers. Uh, this is what I looked like towards the end. All right, <laughs> all right, notice the beard. They would not send me to any customer sites. <laughs> All right, um, and one of the things that we were, in, we were in Bud McClure's office, he was the VP over support, and Tracy Ligon, who was this... Uh, Regional coordinator. Well, the, he was at the time, he was the next evangelical minister. Oh, was really? <laughs> And a pilot, and he went halves on a plane that John Frigate eventually crashed. He survived, though. Um, and we're sitting in uh, Bud McClure's office, and the secretary got this call 
for Tracy. And she put it in the Bud's office and put it on the speakerphone in Bud. So Tracy was telling the guy, oh, do this, do this. And he did something stupid. And Tracy just stood up and yelled at the phone, you can't do that, you. <laughs> and I just saw Bud McClure's face just melt onto his desk. <laughs> Turned out it was a friend of Tracy, so it's uh, so there was a few other things that are off color too. I won't say. So, any other questions? I think I covered most of everything I wanted to talk about. Oh, we can talk about. Oh, I'll give one good thing. There was two things that happened on the what would now be called the internet. There was a news and notes files. I don't know if any of you know what that is. Uh, prior to the internet, everything was UUCP, Unix and Unix Communications Protocol. You know, with the Zenith systems, they were like bulletin boards that sprang up. And my office mate was Steve Fintel. He designed the 2000. And we were out motorcycle riding one day. He bought this uh, Honda 500 Silverwing. And so we were out so riding motorcycles one day. And I went back to his place, swimming in the hot tub, my wife and his wife. And I drove home. And then he wrote a thing and posted it to the wrecked up motorcycles. And about how it was a nice day because it was hot and then cooling off in the pool and the hot tub and everything. Then we had a beer in the hot tub. And some guy came in there about, oh, you shouldn't ever drink anything and drive. Well, first off, in Texas at the time, you could legally drink and drive. The Texas liquor stores along the highway had pull up windows and sold roadies for 25 cents, which was a cup of ice. <laughs> but Texas was one of the first states to have point oh eight, and they were draconian about it. But you go to softball games, there'd be a keg in the dugout. But but you could drink, but you could not be intoxicated. Well, anyway, Steve wrote this thing, and this guy reamed him a new butt for even being on a motorcycle after drinking a beer. So Steve went home and wrote this really nasty article called Damn Mad, and stood for Drunks Against Mothers Against Drunk Driving. Very good taste. And he posted it. And the article wasn't near as bad as what the title was. It was much worse than the title suggests. All right, I mean, it was really inflammatory. It broke our backs with the, 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 all the email that responded. So Steve got called into the, to the uh, director's uh, office and got reamed and everything. And said, you guys gotta be careful, blah, 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 blah. Okay. Well, then about a week or so later, some guy posted this thing in Rec.Auto about radar jamming by putting bungel foil behind a radiator. Obviously, doesn't know anything about it. Well, I'm a ham radio operator, I've done things. So I wrote this article called The Hitchhiker's Guide to Radar Jamming. And I posted it. And it not only, first off, it told how radar works, how Doppler works, how the frequency compresses, and so on. And then I wrote how it could be fooled by some things as simple as a spark plug inside a funnel, if you know what you're doing and do it a certain way. And then at the very end of the article, I wrote about the Custom Signals KR11 handgun, which was real popular, because it had a jamming detect feature. And I knew how that worked. And I posted it. And we got, I think, someone said 3,000 emails the next morning. Broke the backs again. All but three of them were requests for more information. <laughs> All right? Now, I had signed that as Mikey and Trisfax, because our Trisfax protocol was your first name and last initial. And the guy that really blasted me was a guy named Bill Park, or Bob Parnas at a t and Labs in New Jersey. And he, he and I got into a fight for about a week. And at the end of that, though, we, we buried the hatchet. And we're actually pretty good buddies after that. But years later, when I went to Ray Hall Interland, someone goes, oh, you were from Candy. Do you know a guy named Mikey at Trisfax? <laughs> <laughs> they had it archived. So, anything else? I can get off this damn stage. Yep. <laughs> well, thank you, Mike. Thank you. Uh, and Paul wouldn't be able to scream at me because I didn't give her, well, I did a few things that are going to give me this book, but I didn't give the details. But yeah, Paul's, Paul's new book is going to do uh, the mostly two trails, mostly true tales. He called me Thursday and screamed at me about, don't give it away. 
Uh, but he's reorganizing the book, and that's going to be a, in a much better format than what what he was originally going to do. I think it'll be enjoyable. And if he gets ever off, ever gets off his butt to write it, but he, I know he has a lot of source material. All right, folks, we'll take about a 10-minute break, and then we're going to have the Tandy Trivia Contest right in this room. And actually, Mike is one of the panelists, so come back and join us. Well, one of the Yeah, you blame Tandy for how I talk.